my pleasure to introduce Catherine Hess. I met you, uh, Catherine, some years ago in Leipzig on the occasion of a workshop uh, at the Max Planck Institute on statistics and uh, geometry. I must say that uh, I was very impressed by your presentation on the use of topology in your neuroscience. Um, and I was also very impressed by the blue brain projects that you explained us uh, that, that, that day. Okay. So Catherine, it's a great pleasure for me to, to welcome you here. Please, it's up to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pascal. I'd like to thank the organizers for having invited me to speak in this event, which I think is very exciting. I think there's a tremendous potential for application of all kinds of mathematics and machine learning. And today I'm going to talk about how topology in particular can be useful in machine learning. So as many people who are attending this know, this event should have taken place just about exactly a year ago in Paris, but for obvious reasons, it was canceled. And uh, while I was very sad at the time, in fact, this delay has made it possible to, for me to give an even more interesting talk. This talk is actually, or at least the last third of it or so, is actually quite different from what it would have been a year ago, because this area of research at the interface between topology and machine learning is incredibly dynamic. There's almost an explosion of research going on in this area. And as you'll see towards the end of this talk, Many of the results I'll be presenting, which are not mine, I'm going to be talking about other people's work, are from the last few months, in fact. And there's incredibly exciting research going on in this area, and I hope to be able to share some of this excitement with you over the course of the next 40 minutes or so. So, first I'm going to start with an introduction to what topological data analysis is, because that is the fundamental tool which we'll be talking about. And then I'm going to talk about sort of static TDA input to machine learning, how to use machine learning in order to interpret uh, results from topological data analysis. And then I'm going to talk about more dynamic TDA input to machine learning, so how you can build topological data analysis into neural networks in order to improve performance, to better optimize, to regularize, and to repel adversarial attacks, for example. As I said, this last part is really going to be uh, about other people's work. I'll have to talk a little bit about my own work, uh, sort of more towards the beginning of the talk. So let's go on. So let me start by saying something about what topology is. So topology is not the kind of mathematics that everybody studies in school, although maybe I would encourage people to do so. It's a beautiful area of mathematics. But it's, it's a mathematics of shape. It's a mathematics of connectivity, how things are connected together and how the, the different ways things are connected together are related and so on. Uh, the notion of proximity is something that we, we can make very precise in the mathematics of topology. But topology in particular is, that, is one part of mathematics that is particularly good for characterizing and describing global structures that emerge from local constraints. And this is a really interesting thing to think about if you're thinking about networks of any kind, as I often think about networks of neurons when thinking about neuroscience. So what does this have to do with machine learning? Well, let's first see something about what it has to do with data science in general, so with statistics. And so what I'm going to talk about is topological data analysis and which is providing us with new tools for statistics or general data science that are based on the, uh, the mathematics of topology. So I'm going to start with an introduction to topological data analysis, which is usually abbreviated just TDA. So the guiding philosophy of TDA is that if you have a large enough data set, one thing that's really important to think about is its shape. And you can learn things about how to interpret the data and how to extract interesting uh, structure from the data by looking at its shape and encoding that shape in what people often call some sort of topological signature. And this is just, it can be just a number, a polynomial, a matrix. Uh, we'll see various kinds of topological signatures that are you know, sort of small uh, descriptors that one can use in order to capture some of the shape of this data set. And then the idea is that you should be able to feed these topological signatures in some way to machine learning in order to be able to discover interesting things about this, this structure and learn things about your data set. 
So here's the basic TDA workflow. We start with data presented in some way, and I'll give some examples in a moment. And what you're going to do is convert that data in some way to what's called a point cloud. So this is a collection of points, usually in some metric space, or maybe it's just quasi-metric or something, but we have some notion of distance or similarity between points in this space. And once you have that, then from that, you're going to construct a sort of a sequence of topological spaces, geometric objects like this, one included in the other. This is what we call a filtration. And from this filtration, we're going to extract some kind of topological signature. And one of the most famous kinds of these topological signatures is what's called a barcode. It looks something like an actual barcode, like I represented there. But let me just insist on the fact that the key notion here is that of filtration. Filtration here meaning something like this inclusion of various geometric spaces one into the other. And you look at the relationship, how the shape of this space evolves as you move through the filtration. So let's have a page of mathematics. I'm going to introduce the key mathematical notions that are important for talking about PDA, what kind of topological signatures we're interested in, and then for talking about how we can possibly arrange for such signatures to act as input to machine learning. So here are these mathematical notions. And so the first most important notion is that of a simplicial complex. So a simplicial complex is a big bird, is like some sort of object, a vernatorial object or geometric object that's built from points, vertices, line segments, edges, filled in triangles, solid tetrahedra, and so on, that are glued together along their faces. So the global term for these various pieces, the building blocks of simplicial complexes, are what we call simplices. So vertices, edges, triangles, and so on, are examples of simplices. And when you have such a simplicial complex, you can be interested in finding various descriptors of your simplicial complex. So here's an example of one of these simplicial complexes, which I stole from Wikipedia. It's a nice uh, triangulation of the torus, and we see that it's made up of points, the vertices, edges, and triangles. And so one of the local descriptors you can use for a simplicial complex is just to count how many simplices you have of the various dimensions, how many vertices, how many edges, how many triangles, and so on. And this is a, just a very sort of statistical approach. You just count numbers of things, but that already gives you some information about your simplicial complex. Another thing you may be interested in counting is what's called the Betty numbers. And so if you think about it, the, if you glue uh, some of these simplices together in various ways, you can create cavities. If you're gluing a bunch of edges together, you can form a loop, for example, a cycle. That's going to be a one-dimensional cavity. You could have uh, also a two-dimensional cavity, which would be like the interior of this torus here. This gives us a nice two-dimensional cavity. And there are two of these sort of one-dimensional cavities. We're actually talking about equivalence classes of such, but I don't want to go into the details of the equivalence relation. But we have one that's going around the meridian here and one that is going around longitudinally. So we have actually two one-dimensional cavities in this case. So we're interested in counting these sort of Betty numbers. And I'll just point out one here, we actually have a two-dimensional cavity as well, which is the interior of the torus. And then an interesting global uh, descriptor of a simplicial complex is its Euler characteristic, which is simply the alternating sum of the simplex counts. And what is sort of mathematically magical here is that the alternating sum of the simplex counts is actually equal as well to the alternating sum of the Betty numbers. So the number of zero simplices minus the number, the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of triangles minus the number of tetrahedra, et cetera, is equal to the number of zero dimensional cavities, which is the number of connected components, minus the number of one dimensional cavities, the number of loops, plus the number of two dimensional cavities, etc. And this is a really simple to define, but very powerful global descriptor of simplicial complexes. The final sort of key mathematical notion I want to mention goes back to this key notion of filtration. And so this is a sequence of nested simplicial complexes. So one simplicial complex contained in the other, where you just have you, you just keep adding new vertices, edges, triangles, and so on. And it's when you have something like one of these nested simplicial complexes that you can start applying the machinery of topological data analysis. So let's go back and see how this workflow actually goes. So how do we get from data to a point cloud? So here we have data presented as some sort of, uh, some sort of value that's varying from some sort of time series. 
And we'd like to be able to analyze this time series. And one way to do that is through what's called a Takins embedding, where you take three points that are equidistant in time, such as this here, and you look at the corresponding values of your curve for those x's, and you use those three points as coordinates in three space. And you do this, you take three points and you shift and you shift and you shift, and you get the sequence of, of points in three space. And so you can translate a curve like this into a bunch of point cloud in Euclidean three space. And you want to analyze this point cloud. And so how does this go? Well, what you do is you're going to build a sequence of nested complexes by taking little balls around each of these points of various radii and you let the radii grow. And when two little balls intersect, then you're going to join these two points by an edge. And if when we continue growing the radius, when we have, here we get, again, some of these balls that are intersecting and we're joining the points with edges, if it grows even more, then all of a sudden we start having triangles that are getting filled in or even tetrahedra. So we're starting to have, in this case, a two simplex, in this case, a three simplex, and we're starting to build up a simplicial complex by looking at how these balls are overlapping as the radius grows and grows and grows and keeps growing giving more and more edges and triangles and tetrahedra until everything is all filled in. And so we have this nested sequence of simplicial complexes. Now, how are we going to translate something like that into some sort of topological descriptor? This is where barcodes start to come in. So let's analyze the situation. So here we have a sequence of simplicial complexes, K1, K2, K3, K4 here. This one just has four vertices and an edge. Here we have six vertices and three edges. And now we have even a filled in triangle and so on, there'll be no tetrahedra in this case. And so what do we do when we analyze a sequence of nested simplicial complexes like this? Well, one thing we can do is look at the Betty numbers of all of these simplicial complexes and look at the sequence thereof. So in this case of K1, the, the zero Betty numbers counting number of what we call of these zero degree cavities, that is to say just the number of connected components. In K1, we have three connected components. So B0, K, beta is zero, K1 is three. Here we have again, now we have four different connected components. So there we have four. Here, all these things are now connected together. So we have only two connected components. Beta zero is two. And we still have two connected components here. And what we do then is associate two this um, a barcode here, well, what we have is every time we have one of these um, bars here in, this is where we're at the first step of the filtration. And then when we get to the second step of the filtration, there's these two that end up being joined into one class here so that this bar comes to an end, but we have these other bars that continue and we have two new bars that are created corresponding to these new points that are added. New, com uh, new connected components, and so on. So what, what this barcode here is, meant, is uh, describing is the formation of these connecting components and how they join together or new ones are created and so on. Whereas in dimension one, what we're looking at are the number of cycles that we have, the number of loops. Here we have no loops, here we have one, here we have two, and here we have just one again. And there, so we have this one, loop that appeared here, but then gets filled in. So that's one that lasts from two to three. Then we have two new loops that are created at three. One of them actually gets filled in at four. And so we have another bar that goes from three to four and the other one that just continues. So these barcodes are ways of translating the evolution of these Betty numbers through the filtration of the simplicial complex. And so these are the sorts of signatures of topological signatures we're interested in studying. Now there's an alternate way of talking about barcodes, which is what's called persistence diagrams. So here I have a barcode with various bars going from zero to two, zero to four. So measuring when a class is born and when it dies, that's the language that's used. And so you can translate back and forth between a barcode like this and what's called a persistent diagram. So in a persistence diagram, you plot for each bar in the barcode, a point in this upper half plane where the first coordinate, the X coordinate is the value at which the bar is born. And the Y value coordinate is where it dies at the end. So it's the two ends of the bar. So for example, this bar here, which goes from zero to two, corresponds to a point in the persistence diagram here. Whereas this bar here that goes from two to three corresponds to 
this point in the persistence diagram here. So we can go back and forth between these two representations and they are equivalent, but sometimes one is more useful for the other depending on what exactly you're trying to do. So we have these ways of assigning these topological signatures, barcodes or equivalently persistence diagrams to one of these filtered simplicial complexes or nested complexes. Okay, but that seems like a kind of an odd thing to do. What if your data is a little bit you know, off or something like that? If you perturb your data a little bit, are, this, are the topological signatures that are going to get similar? That's where the notion of stability becomes important. So it turns out that if you consider that either the set of barcodes or the set of persistence diagrams, you can com com equip them with sort of earth mover type distances, Wasserstein type distances or something that's called the bottleneck distance that are very provide very useful metrics on these spaces and you, so that you can think about them themselves as topological spaces if you want. And it turns out that with the that for most of the instantiations that one uses currently uh, and frequently of the TDA pipeline, most of these are actually Lipschitz continuous with respect to, on the one hand, the Hausdorff distance on the point clouds. So there's a notion of distance between uh, between point clouds, and that this is and with respect to the bottleneck distance on the resulting persistence diagram. So there is a notion of stability. If you have two point clouds that are close enough to each other, one is just a slight perturbation of the other, then the corresponding persistence diagrams will also be close to each other. So this is a desirable characteristic if you want to be able to use these particular topological signatures to say anything about the structure of data, because you always have to be sensitive to the possibility of noise in your data. Okay. So if you want actually to do computations with something like this, we're lucky in that many people have devoted a lot of time to creating excellent software for doing these computations. Mo many of them are open source, such as uh, Woody, which is uh, from INRIA, Ripser from Uli Bauer, Flagser from Daniel Lutke-Hadman and company, Giotto TDA, which is created by L2F at TPFL, or in collaboration with TPFL. So there are fantastic libraries of software which are good for doing these computations. Also, one of the questions that comes up, of course, when you are reducing so much information to a relatively simple topological signature is say, to say, okay, I have the signature, I can say things about it, I can use things for classification, but how can I then go back and interpret the results in terms of my original data? And among others, uh, Yasuhiro Oka and his collaborators and uh, and also Steve Udo in, in, uh, at INRIA, people ha have worked on these uh, developing inverse analysis tools. It's a really interesting and hard problem. And I don't have time to talk about it today, but I, if you're interested, I highly recommend that you take a look at what's available in the literature. Now there so far, I've talked about just what happens when you're filtering sort of just along one particular parameter. We were looking at the radius just of these, of these balls that were growing. And in real life data, often you want to be filtering along several different parameters. So if you have some sort of point cloud of data, it could be that you also want not to filter not only in terms of the distance between the points, but also some sort of density measure, or you could have a point cloud that is evolving in time, and so you also want to take a time variable into consideration. So you might be wanting to filter along many directions. So this turns out to be a much harder problem to solve than just filtering along one direction because there are theoretical, both theoretical and implementational issues. So we don't have topological signatures that are as well behaved as barcodes or persistence diagrams when we have many parameters. Um, in part, if we want to use purely mathematical language, it's a question of the fact that um, the, the representations of, of um, polynomial rings and many variables are wild, and so we don't have this kind of control, but um, there's still some workarounds. So one thing that one might do if you're thinking about filtering along two different parameters, so you have a pair of parameters in which you want to be, you have, for example, for each point in the upper right-hand quadrant, you might have a, a simplicial complex, so they have this inclusion spreading along the uh, quadrant. What you can do is actually just look at what's happening along a particular line and do look at look at the associated barcode, and that's what's called, called a fibered barcode that turns out to be very useful for doing this kind of analysis. Or you can try to decompose such um, a bi-graded module into, into blocks instead of into bars. Not always possible, but sometimes you can, and then that's a, a useful approach. <laughs> 
Okay, so that's our very quick overview of the foundations of topological data analysis. Now I'm going to talk about how we can feed the output of topological data analysis into machine learning in order to try to interpret the results for classification purposes or otherwise. So what I want to talk about is different strategies that exist for what's called either vectorization or featureization of the output of topological data analysis. The problem is that if you consider the space of barcodes or the space of persistent diagrams, yes, we have, uh, we can define topologies on these spaces with respect to some of the metrics that I talked about, but these are not nice spaces. There's no way that we can talk about computing means or, or, or modes of standard deviations, the usual statistics that with one, that one is interested in. If you have some collection of barcodes that you want to study and you want to see, be able to say things statistically about it, it's difficult because these spaces just don't lend themselves to that. So you need to find some way to work around this. Solution that is often applied is to define some way of mapping barcodes into a vector space. So you want to have a nice vector space that you understand well, equipped with some sort of inner product. It's giving you a nice notion of, of norm and of distance between the, between the vectors. And if you have some nice way of mapping from the space of barcodes or persistence diagrams into this vector space, then now you can compute statistics in the vector space. So there are a couple of different approaches to this, one of which involves finding some sort of embedding of your barcodes into some nice finite dimensional Euclidean space, so that's really nice and under control, or you could apply kernel methods where there are various ways of defining sort of generalized scalar products on persistence diagrams and persistence barcodes so that you can actually interpret the persistence diagrams as elements of some infinite dimensional Hilbert space. And again, you have statistics at your disposal. So I'm going to talk a little bit about various approaches to doing this. Now, there are you know, certain disadvantages to both these methods. On the one hand, in the case when you're looking at embeddings into finite dimensional Euclidean spaces, then you have relatively few trainable parameters. And with the kernel methods, then they quickly become expensive if the number of points in your persistence diagram becomes too large. So we have to find ways to work around those issues. So how do we go about vectorization? One way to do so is to compute what are called Betty curves. So suppose we have a barcode that we've computed for cavities of dimension k, so for the kth Betty number. So here's my barcode with bars going from 0 to 1, 0 to 3, 1 to 2, and 4 to 5. And say, okay, well, what do I do with this barcode? Well, I'm going to do something rather drastic and just look at it sort of as a, as a uh, piecewise linear curve. So I'm just going to say, okay, at time zero, how many bars exist? Well, there are two, so I put two. At time one, how many exist? Well, at time one, there are one, two, three bars that are either ending, continuing, or starting. At point two, I again have two bars. At time three, I have one. At time four, I have one, and then time five, I have one. And so I just note that here as some sort of curve that is called the Betty curve, the kth Betty curve. And it seems, again, to have collapsed even more information, but it turns out that this Betty curve actually contains a fair amount of information, enough to feed into machine learning to be able to extract interesting uh, information about your original data. Now that you have a curve, this is something that you know how to do statistics with. You know how to take a sum of curves and so on. So here's an example of such a computation of a Betty curve. So here we have a very simple uh, nested complex. So suppose I have just a, a, little, a little graph here with different weights on the edges, alpha less than beta, less than gamma. And so when I'm at zero threshold, I have only the four vertices. At threshold alpha, now I can include these side edges as well. At threshold beta, I now have all four edges. And at gamma, now I've filled in the triangles as well because I have this edge here. So this is one of the, an example of one of these nested complexes. And again, I can compute how many connected components I have at each stage. So at Betty zero is here, I have four, two, one, and one. So here is this first Betty curve up through alpha, we're at four. Between alpha and beta, we have two components. Between beta and gamma and onwards, we have one component. So this is the Betty zero curve. And here we have the Betty 1 curve at first, because that's counting the number of loops. We have no loop, no loop. Ah, here we have a loop, but then it gets filled in when we get to gamma. So we have 0, 0, 0 until we get to beta. Then we have 1, and then it goes back down to 0. 
So these are the sorts of curves that one computes for these filtered complexes, these nested complexes. Okay. Now, one can collapse even further the parent information. So suppose we have the Betty zero curve. So this is this one I was just describing. And you can say, well, okay, what is the X value for which, uh, which is the, the maximum of the X values for which you're attaining a maximum value here? So if, like, some sort of arbitrary number that we're associating to this curve, or you could hire, take the maximum of the Betty one curve, for example. So these are ways of just extracting simple numerical features from these curves. So we're collapsing the amount of information even further. And it turns out that even after this collapse, you still have maintaining a fair amount of information. So numbers, of course, are something you can feed easily to machine learning. Another way to featureize or vectorize these sort of the barcodes or persistence diagrams is through what's called persistence landscapes. It's another way of associating curves to barcodes. So there's a way of taking a barcode like this and translating it into a family of piecewise linear curves that are called landscapes. So the, these things look like mountainous landscapes. And the joke I like to make is that Bubinik, who was one of the inventors of this, was actually a postdoc with me in Lausanne for a couple of years. And I like to think it was the influence of the mountains across the lake, across Lake Geneva that uh, inspired him to create persistence landscapes. But in any case, it gives you just a family of curves. And once you have a family of curves, that's something you can do statistics on. And then there's a natural sort of landscape distance that one can talk about between barcodes as being the distance, some sort of L2 version of distance between the landscapes. And this turns out to be another useful vectorization, sorry. And now we can sort of marry the notions of persistence landscape and Betty curves to a generalization due to Chung and Lawson, different kinds of persistence curves. So this is a simultaneous generalization of Betty curves and persistence landscapes. So this is just a particular where you can you can vary what it is that you're computing at each at each time step and by making various choices so for some function t which can be taking the sum or the maximum what you do is for any particular function here at time t you're just going to look at the for example either just take one for each pair b and d where b is less than a t and so those are the bars that are alive at that time or you do various computations with this is the birth time and this is the death time of a bar and you can sum them all up. There are various things one can do that are sort of entropy related and so on. And so these variants of the notion of, um, of the Betty curves also provide us with interesting information. Similarly, and this also turns out to be in a powerful way to proceed, one can compute uh, the Euler characteristic at each time. And that also gives you an interesting curve, the Euler curve, which is also very revealing of the structure in this context. Yet another way to proceed, and another way to vectorize or featureize, is what's called persistence images. So this was first developed by Adam et al. in an article in the Journal of Machine Learning Research in 2017. So the idea is as follows. What you're going to do is to smooth your persistence diagram, replacing each point by a Gaussian kernel, then taking the sum of those Gaussian kernels and then that's going to give you um, a function in the upper right hand quadrant of your plane and in order to make it computable then you're going to discretize so that you can actually now associate to your function upper right hand quadrant you can look at as a matrix where the value any in any entry of the matrix is the the, fun the function value averaged over that square and so this is beautifully represented by these sorts of heat maps that are very revealing. It's not, it's not only a useful uh, tool from, um, as input to machine learning, but it's also very visually useful for understanding and interpreting the data. And in the case when you actually think about many parameters, this is a very recent paper by Carrier and Blumberg, where they said, okay, well, let's try to do something similar for this in the multi-parameter context. So when you have, for example, two parameters along which you're filtering. So I said that this is a difficult situation. We don't handle it quite as well. And they had this idea of looking at parameterized families of lines in the plane and looking at the barcodes along this parameterized family and then doing matchings of the barcodes sort of as you move through the filtration. And so you can do this for various, uh, various parameterized families of lines. And the, what you get are sort of parameterized matchings of the bars in the different barcodes. And that is quite revealing of 
the structure in this multi-parameter situation. So it turns out that this way of proceeding is actually robust to noise and it matches or outperforms other multi-parameter methods. So they tested it, for example, on predicting cancer survival from images of tumors. Okay, so just to mention briefly what sorts of machine learning methods are useful in this context with vectorized or parameterized TEA. In our own work, we've used both decision trees and support vector machines and CNNs, and even to a certain extent, uh, GNN, random forests have also, also, also come into play. So let me just say a couple of words about examples to which uh, my collaborators and I have applied these sorts of methods. For example, we've used methods uh, of TDA and fed into different machine learning uh, techniques in order to characterize neuron morphologies. So we have ways of associating uh, barcode to uh, a tree embedded in three space. And then you can look at the associated persistence diagram. And here we have just different families of neurons from different species. And then this in the last column here, we're looking at the associated persistence images, the average persistence image over the family. Again, this is something we can do with persistence images that we can't do with the, the barcodes, but it gives us a way of being able to classify and characterize the differences between these different families of neurons. So this is one where we can see it very well by eye. We've also applied it in contexts where it's more subtle, where we're classifying the differences between different kinds of uh, pyramidal cells in rat cortex, for example. Another example of applications of TDA in machine or applications of machine learning to TDA uh, work with um, Jean-Baptiste Bardin and Gerhard Freeman, in which we use TDA methods to go about automated classification of dynamic regimes in different networks of neurons under different uh, conditions. And where it worked extremely well, we actually, we did precisely what I was describing earlier, looking at the Betty curves, and then looking simply at numerical, um, numerical values extracted from these Betty curves and using that as input to machine learning. And it gave us very, very highly accurate classification of these dynamic regimes in these admittedly artificial networks of neurons. And there's been some application of this as well to real life data, which has been quite promising. Finally, in collaboration with Yongjin Li, Pavel Lotko, uh, Bernd Schmidt, and um, various other collaborators, Senja Bartel, we work together on applying these methods to uh, stand, studying what are called nanoporous materials, where the point cloud in question was actually coming from real life models of these sort of nanoporous materials, where you can actually see the cavities and the tunnels and so on. And associated to these different nanoporous materials, you can associate the barcodes in dimensions zero, one, and two. And these turned out to be very powerful topological signatures for nanoporous materials for classifying them according to their performance properties. So there are really uh, interesting real life examples of applications of this. So to conclude, I wanna talk about how TDA can actually work with machine learning, not just as input to machine learning, but actually be part of the machine learning pipeline itself. So this is really talking a lot about other people's work. I hope that I'm not going to, and I hope that I'm going to do them justice. I think there's, a, as I said earlier, a lot of tremendously exciting work going on here. And I just hope to give you a brief overview. So the first one I want to talk about is due to Mathieu Carrière and his collaborators published last year. So this is a differentiable neural network layer for learning vectorizations of persistence diagrams. So instead of saying, I choose my vectorization and I use that, you can actually learn the best vectorization. And so it's applicable to what are called extended persistent diagrams. I'm not going to go into what that is, derived from uh, graphs with labeled nodes. And they succeeded in encoding most classical vectorizations of persistence diagrams in this framework. And then they tested it in a very simple two layer neural network with first lay as the first layer. So this topological layer is the first layer and some fully connected second layer. And then they used it to uh, on some synthetic data arising from orbits in dynamical systems, some typical benchmark dynamical systems. And it was, they were able to achieve state of the art results and then 
when they were looking at classification problems coming from real life data, their results were comparable to those from standard methods. So it was a very, a very useful and helpful first step to actually be able to learn the appropriate vectorization. Variant of that, P, it's called PLA. This is instead of using persistence diagrams, you want to use these persistence landscapes, so the little mountains that I was talking about earlier, in a weighted version. So we have a new kind of topological layer based on these persistence landscapes. And so I'd like to just point out the date here. This is January 18th of this year that it appeared on the archive. And so this is again differentiable. And the structure of the layer is actually learned as well during training via backprop. Turns out that this method is robust against noise and perturbation of the input data. And here's an example of how it can be applied. So they were looking at two different kinds of uh, artificial data, MNIST and then these uh, dynamic orbits again, looking at how well they could be classified and comparing standard MLPs with standard CNNs. And this CNN plus P is when you put this PL layer in the machine learning pipeline as one of the layers in your, in your network. And you see that it greatly improves or improves actually quite remarkably, uh, the, uh, the accuracy of this classification and that the standard deviation is not very high. So just to, and then did a comparison as well with Perslay for this data and see that it even there's um, an improvement with respect to that. So this seems to be an interesting direction in which to be looking. Another way in which topology is being directly integrated into neural networks is into graph neural networks. So here is an example that was came out in the archive just last year, in which there was a team that wanted to use topological data analysis methods for studying proteins, for being able to do something about protein function from protein structure. So here they used uh, persistent homology dimensions one and two, so using uh, one-dimensional cavities and two-dimensional cavities, and and they wanted to sort of take that kind of structural data from the protein and sort of combine it in an appropriate way with a graph neural network. And it turns out that they could show that this combination network was able to outperform either method when taken individually and did quite well at predicting protein function from structure. And it displayed transferability in the sense that if it was good for predicting one kind of function, it was good for predicting another kind of function as well. So here's just an illustration from their paper of the basic architecture. So if you have a 3D protein, you can describe it in terms of coordinates in three space. They're particularly interested in the contact points in the protein because the proteins are all folded, you know. And so from this, from that point cloud data, they were able to compute persistence diagrams for both the one and two dimensional structure. And at the same time, they took the graphical representation of the protein and fed that into a graph convolutional network. And then fed all of this together. So these are the, the uh, persistence layers into a more uh, standard linear classifier and had quite nice output. As we see here, if you look at precision versus recall, that when you're doing this persistent GNN, you have a great improvement in terms of performance, even compared to the graph neural network by itself or just doing the persistent part by itself. So it's a really useful combination in this context of studying protein structure versus function. Next, almost the end. So this one is from just a couple of weeks ago, February 15th. So you definitely wouldn't have been able to give this talk even a month ago. So the point here, we're talking again about graph neural networks. And, and the point of this work is to say that, you know, usually when in graph neural networks, they work with message passing schemes between different nodes. But this is sort of a very local thing to do. And so in that, for that reason, it's not very sensitive to sort of more complex topological structures such as cycles. And so what they wanted to do, what they did, was to integrate what they call topological graph layer or toggle into a graph neural network in order to increase the sensitivity to topological structure across a range of scales. Because when we think about uh, persistence, we're really doing something that's multi-scale. And so it turns out that this is again a differentiable layer and they say that it's easily integrable into any kind of GNN. And they proved that it's also strictly more powerful than the Weisfeller Lehman uh, iterative label refinement, which is sort of like the a benchmark test for GNNs. Finally, 
they were able to show that it improved indeed predictive performance on various benchmark tests. So here's an example, which is from their paper, where they had some synthetic data sets in which they were to which they were looking called cycles and necklaces, and they were comparing the sort of standard GCNN with their toggle network. And so there's always this blue curve here, and we see that the blue curve is in general quite far above the other one. So that inclu including this this topological layer, which is sensitive to this higher structure, does um, give us more insight. So the last uh, one of the last things I want to talk about is more related to optimization. So this, in this even more recent paper from the 18th of February by Mathieu Carrière, Frédéric Chazal, and others, there's a new framework for definition and computation of gradients and what they call functions of persistence. So what they mean by functions of persistence are things like, such things as the total persistence of a persistence diagram, so the sum of all of the lengths of the bars, the Western standard bottleneck distance to a fixed persistence diagram or persistence landscapes. Excuse me, it's about yeah. time to conclude now. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'll just okay, I'll just go through this. And in any case, the point is that you can use this for improved dimension reduction versus via topological autoencoders and to improve the filtration selection. So it gives you, for example, a better way of embedding clouds in space and also can greatly improve performance when you're by allowing you to tune the filtration that you're going to choose. So I don't have time to talk about the last one that I wanted to mention, which is about topological loss functions. So I'll instead just thank you very much for your attention and for your invitation. I hope I've given you a little indication of all of the extremely exciting work that's going on at the interface of topology and machine learning. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kathleen. I have selected for you uh, two questions from the audience. So the first question is, is topological data analysis badly affected by curse of dimensionality? And That's a really uh, good question. Yeah, so uh, it, it certainly is sometimes, and one has to be very, very careful to, to avoid that, that kind of problem. But um, it's... Uh, yeah, as long as one is careful, it's not uh, it's not an issue. But yes, one has to be aware of it. And another question is about uh, computational aspects. Is the computation of persistence diagrams and signature expensive compared to classical machine learning? So there are increasingly efficient methods of computing them. So this is not really considered to be a problem anymore. It's a it's really it's actually computing the persistence diagrams is not is not a very computationally expensive what can be expensive, somewhat more expensive is sometimes computing distances between such things but even that is uh, going increasingly uh, people the newest software is incredibly fast for doing some of these computations particularly since they're they're developing gpu versions and parallelizing and so it's uh, yeah these things can go quite fast now Okay, once again, thank you very much, Catherine. This was a very inspiring talk. Uh, personally, I, I'm a, a, an absolute fan of your, what you are doing. So I was very, very pleased to hear you today. And, thank you very uh, much. Can... <laughs> yeah.